thank you for joining us for this week's edition of It's Your City. I'm your host, Courtney Bloomer. Today's episode is brought to you by Wired Wednesday Digital Artists Group, pleased to bring you the Carson City Citywide Short Film Competition. Everyone in the community is invited to the Brewery Arts Center for the screening of these locally made and produced films at the Brewery Arts Center on May 6th. Our guest today is Lori Nichols. She's a licensed social worker, um, and she's also the foster family recruiter for the Division of Child and Family Services. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, being the foster recruiter, this is a really important month for you because we are right now in the middle of Child Abuse Prevention Month. Tell us a little bit about, about that. Well, April is Child Abuse uh, Prevention Month, and so that's a national rec nationally recognized event. Um, it's really important for people here locally in Carson City and everywhere in the rural region of Nevada, the whole state, to know that child abuse and neglect does happen. And it happens in rich neighborhoods, it happens in middle class neighborhoods, uh, and certainly lower class neighborhoods. So it's really important for people to understand that it does happen, and people need to be aware of the signs to look for. Let's talk about that for a second because that's a really good point. People maybe don't know what to look for with regards to child abuse and there are kids who are suffering um, and aren't getting the attention that they need. What are some, some tip-offs that, that maybe should prompt people to call DCFS and have, have a kid uh, checked out to make sure they're doing okay? Well, definitely if there's a mark on a child that's visible, um, you know, most of the time if it's a physical abuse issue that's ongoing, marks are going to be, you know, in places that you wouldn't see. But certainly if, if someone views a mark on the face or anywhere on the body that looks suspicious, they should report it. Um, also, when kids look real disheveled, maybe they're asking for food a lot, um, you know, things like that that just... Most people kind of have that awareness like, oh, something doesn't quite look right. Um, and there may not be abuse or neglect going on in every situation, but it's good for people to report it and then we can determine whether or not that's going to be looked at closer. All right. Now, as a kid who was pretty much always beat up, I was just, a, I was an outdoor kid. You know, I always had sure. bruises on me. I was never neglected in any way. But, uh, you know, what about people who are seeing that type of kid who's maybe not a, an abuse and, and neglect victim, but who is, you know, they might want to report it. Sure. And, and the good thing for, for folks to know is that they can report anonymously. They don't have to give their name. I mean, it helps us. We have to keep that all confidential when we take those reports, but they can do that and not offer their name, certainly. Um, and so anytime there's ever a question, you always want to report. Um, and it may not be anything, um, but it is something just to keep an eye on. Um, you know, and it's, a lot of times people will see multiple symptoms. It's not just one thing. It's like, oh, you know, little Bobby keeps coming over, you know, from next door saying, you know, there's no food in the house, or maybe, you know, he's left alone for long periods of time or something like that. I mean, there's usually multiple things people are witnessing. It's not just one thing. Tell us a little bit about the process of what happens when abuse or neglect is reported. I think a lot of people are hesitant to report abuse and neglect because they don't want to get involved. They're afraid that law enforcement is going to come. They, they just don't want to start something. What's that process actually like? So here in Carson City, anytime someone has uh, concerns about a child being abused or neglected, or even if they have questions, they are always more than welcome to call uh, our local line. That number is 684-1930. That's our local DCFS office. Um, so if they did want to make a report, then they would call that number and, and certain things are going to be asked of them. Um, you know, what, what did you uh, view on the child that makes you concerned about the child? You know, what types of behaviors? Um, what did the child say? Are there any witnesses, other agencies that may be working with the family that had the same types of concerns? Um, who lives in the family? You know, what children are there? Where do they go to school? you know, their names, ages, things like that. And of course, the address and the phone number for the home uh, or for the parents that take care of the child is gonna be asked for. And if you don't have all that information, it's okay. It's okay, yeah. <laughs> and, and we have people call a lot that do ask, just ask questions like, hey, you know, I've got this concern. I don't know if it's reportable. And certainly that's always welcome as, as well for people to call with questions. All right, now uh, last week 
on the lawn of the legislature. Um, you guys had a little display. Talk about that and tell us why um, pinwheels are the, the symbol for Child Abuse Prevention Month. Well, pinwheels are really the symbol of childhood, you know, just whimsical and carefree and really the type of life every child should have. And that's what we use to symbolize, um, you know, Child Abuse Prevention Month. Last Friday, there was an event, and you viewers may have seen all the pinwheels on the uh, legislative lawn. And that really is, again, just to make people aware that child abuse and neglect does occur. Um, and this is the little ribbon that I'm sporting right here, Child Abuse Prevention Month. But uh, last Friday was the Wear Blue campaign, where everybody uh, hopefully was you know, prompted to wear blue so that, again, that raises the awareness of, of child abuse that it happens in our community. The fact is that child abuse does happen here in our community and sometimes when, when that abuse is ongoing or, or substantiated, those children have to be removed from their home. Uh, you're also the foster care coordinator yes. for this area um, and foster families are, are really important. Talk about that. Well, I've been interviewed before many times and always the same message I have for, for folks is that we have a desperate need for, for good quality foster homes here in Carson City and in the rural region of Nevada. Um, I did a count today um, and we had 10 families that were family foster homes specifically for general foster care. Um, six of those families were either full or on hold, so that leaves four. Uh, one was a respite only, which will only take children for a very brief period of time, which is a huge support to our foster families when they need that break. So there's really only three families available here in Carson City, and they are licensed for various ages, um, maybe licensed for boys or girls, or you know have certain situations in their home that would preclude one child from being placed there. Um, so really, if a sibling group came in tonight, we potentially would have to place them in another area like Fallon, or even perhaps Douglas County, so that's something for your viewers to be aware of, is that right. these kids are having to go to different communities if we don't have the space for them here. And, and then that and messes up those communities because then they have to place their children that come into custody in the next neighboring community, which is just kind of this ripple effect. And Right, and, and people may not realize, but it's very disruptive for kids to be pulled out of their school environment and, mm -hmm. and sent off to, to another town. So really, we want to keep them Absolutely. here where, where they're where they're already at. Right, and, and that helps with reunification efforts. Um, always reunification is gonna be the first goal. Um, and so for visitation, um, you know, maintaining those relationships that kids have with teachers and other relatives that may be real supportive um, and good role models in these kids' lives. I mean, when we move these kids out of these communities, out of our community, they lose that right. and it does make reunification more difficult. It puts a strain, definitely a strain on the child, the families, um, the social workers that have to transport. I mean, it's just, it's, it's it has a really poor effect on the whole process. Right. The process for becoming a foster parent, mm -hmm. um, we chatted a little bit about this. I didn't, I didn't know the whole process, but it's actually, um, a fairly intense process to make sure that these families are prepared for whatever might come their way um, with their foster children. Talk about what that process is like and how people can, can get started uh, with the process if they're interested in being a foster family. Okay. Well, first, I always recommend people call. If they have questions about the process or they have specific um, you know, like people always say, well, you know, maybe I got a DUI so many years ago and it was a really bad decision. It was one time and would that preclude me from being licensed? I mean, questions like that, I always welcome people to call because you never know. I mean, they may think in their mind, oh, I would never qualify, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't. Uh, they just need to start asking those questions. Um, so I do recommend people call me at 684-1967. That is my local number. I also have a toll-free number, and that number is 888-423-2659. 
um, but either of those numbers come directly to my desk. Um, we start out the process just by you know, answering questions for them, kind of going through their personal situation, why they're moving forward to get licensed. A lot of people move forward for different reasons. Um, it may be to provide foster care. Maybe they only want to provide respite care for other foster families, um, short-term emergency shelter care, long-term care, even into adoption. So we determine first where they stand in that regard, and then we start with a short interview on the phone um, that takes about 15 minutes, and then I will send them their background check paperwork. Um, we get them signed up into a training that the agency provides. It's 27 hours of what's called the Pride Curriculum for foster and adoptive applicants. We offer those classes in Carson City as well as in Fallon. Um, and so once they get their training done, then they get their application packet. And then once we receive that paperwork back, we start the process for the home study. I mean, it sounds very simplified the way I'm describing it. There's always bumps in the road, certainly, but we try to our very best to make it as streamlined as possible and as clear as possible. But it, it, it's a lot that we ask for people to do to get licensed. And for some people, it might be too much. Yeah. Um, not everyone is, is prepared to be a foster parent. And how can those people um, here in our community support these kids? So I do get calls uh, there, you know, off and on about, you know, what can we do to volunteer and do things like that? You know, the biggest thing is using your voice, that we have a huge need for, for good foster homes here. Um, I always have brochures on hand if people feel like, you know, I want to do something or, you know, even students or, you know, kids at the high school want to do some type of project. I mean, putting out our brochures and businesses and, and, you know, going that route, just people don't know there's a problem if nobody tells them. And so that is the biggest thing is using your voice. Um, also, people that belong to the faith-based community, we're always looking to go speak with churches, um, you know, everywhere in the rural region about the need for foster homes. Our faith-based community is a huge support to our program. And not only through providing foster parents or encouraging people, but supporting those folks that do move forward, whether that's with childcare, meals, prayer, whatever that may look like for, for that community. Um, but um, I just encourage people to call. There's always something that you can do and we can't have people necessarily working with our families or with our children unless they're licensed foster care providers but certainly there's always things that we can find that you know on the perimeter like putting out those brochures and things like that and getting getting us into different civic organizations and groups to speak about the need for for foster homes is always really helpful all right Lori Nichols thanks for stopping Thank by you. today to share with us about uh, Child Abuse Prevention Month, and also the desperate, desperate need for foster families here in our community. Um, tell us one more time um, your phone number and the website where people can go for more information. Okay, so our website is dcfs.nv.gov, and my number is going to be splashed all over that website, but my toll-free number, which is on that website, is 888-423-2659. Five, nine. And you can, even if you're local here in Carson City, you can call that number um, and that you'll get me. I'm right at the desk. So I just encourage your viewers to call me. If you have questions, um, please call me because I would love to talk to you about that. All right. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us for this week's edition of It's Your City, brought to you by the Wired Wednesday Digital Artists Group. Uh, come and check out all the local films produced as part of the Carson City citywide short film competition on May 6th at the Brewery Arts Center. If your organization would like to sponsor a future edition of It's Your City, please contact Darla at the address shown on your screen. I'm your host, Courtney Bloomer. We'll see you next week.